Welcome, Tom. How Thank are you? you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. We'll take a quick run around um, the room just to introduce ourselves. Okay. Um, but I wanted to thank you for coming in. We did invite you in to provide kind of the, a little bit of the background of all the, the deeper work that's been done on minimum wage from an economist standpoint. Thanks. And um, you also wanted to talk about some of the material, some of the contemporary material that's been presented. And so we just, as we do our work on this, we needed to hear um, some kind of nuts and bolts as, as we see it from an economic perspective. So thank you for coming in. Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury. Uh, Representative Matt Byron, the Jens. It was up from Barnard. This Hango from Berkshire. John Galacki, South Burlington. Tommy Waltz, Perry City. Mm -hmm. Chip Triano, Standard. Great. And we will see Representative Howard, I'm sure, at some point today. And um, Representative Gonzalez is out. And um, Representative Long is usually uh, running around the building, so we may not see her. So. <laughs> OK, fine. fine. Well, I'd like to keep this informal and mostly be a resource for you with respect to Q&A. Um, there's a, a lot of material on this, and there's a lot that's been done. Um, and I'm not sure where you're at, but I think that's probably the most effective way to go about it. Uh, the official fiscal note on this was produced by Joyce Manchester, who's here, and uh, is one of the handouts that's there. Uh, this item and it's just a couple of pages I think um, but it gives uh, uh, a synthesis of a lot of different uh, analyses that were done in connection with this and ours was one of those pieces so uh, I can uh, talk about that if there are questions about the broader fiscal note Joyce is here and can uh, comment on those um, we've done minimum wage analyses uh, in the state of Vermont since uh, 1999 was the first one we did for a summer study committee on the minimum wage and um, I have done a number of them since then. They've been similar uh, in, in, in scope and approach. We've gotten data that are unpublished data from the Department of Labor so that we can look at the wage distribution within the state and see how many workers are going to be affected, what industries they're in, uh, what occupations they're in, things like that, and then use that to uh, input that to an economic model that we use uh, on a regular basis to, to look at, at economic impacts from various uh, policy proposals. And uh, we use it in connection with revenue forecasting and a few other things, too. Uh, so we use this model to, to, to try to quantify potential impacts. Um, I say try to because uh, no model is a perfect representation of what happens in the real world. And especially when you propose things that have not occurred in the past and there's no historical record for, uh, the impacts are, are much more uncertain. And this falls into that category. Uh, there are uh, uh, sub-state political jurisdictions that have raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour or more, but uh, nothing at the state level that's uh, been in place uh, and been in place long enough to study any of the impacts from that. So um, I understand that uh, in the context what we talk about because these models will spit out data to three or five or ten decimals or whatever you want. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, uh, 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 it's an estimate based on, on prevailing economic theory, uh, the best data that are available, but it's not the last word on it. it yeah. So in that kind of conversation, though, um, what about look backs? I mean, it, 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 I think I've asked you this question before, but, you know, you did work in 1999 that would have forward or you did when we got up to 1050 is the most yeah. recent one. Um, do you grade yourself afterwards? Do you see, you know, the, that given the given the um, uh, realities, the economic realities, the model, the pieces that you're using to put it together, do you grade yourselves and say, hey, five years later you can go, oh, we, we nailed that, or we were off by 0.5 percent, or, or you know, we guessed wrong here, and I and I, I use that word probably incorrectly, but you made a wrong, you know, maybe an assumption was off. 
Um, it, yeah. It's, it just, I'm trying to say, like, because yeah. the credibility of, of anyone's information sure. informs the future use of that kind of information. Yeah. Um, part of the problem in grading oneself, the two really important components of that that make it difficult. The first is that we would need to collect more data than we collect now to know if the projected impacts came about or not. And there are a few political jurisdictions that have done that. The state of Washington, after the Seattle uh, minimum wage increase, had some, some very thorough data collection recommendations, which they followed through on, such that there could be analysis done. Now, the preliminary results from that resulted in two different analyses that came to two different conclusions. But over time, uh, with enough peer review, I, I think the data wouldn't lie. And then you could look at it and say, OK, this is the impact. You need good data. And uh, some of that needs to be collected with governmental uh, uh, precision and, and uh, thoroughness. Uh, so the government's in a position to both request and to require certain information, and, and that would be a great benefit. One of the things in the third <laughs> handout that I, that's there, there are three groups of handouts, is a collection of three memos uh, that were recent memos on minimum wage, proposed minimum wage changes. And one of the things that we recommend in, in the first of those that uh, is a um, uh, is an impact monitoring capacity. So it costs a little bit of money. It's maybe uh, $15,000 or $20,000 of analytic uh, uh, work. But then you do have an idea. Is this working like we thought it would? Or, or are, there, are there some effects that are problematic and we should change course? Uh, especially if you have a multi-year change like that. So that, that I think, is, is an important aspect of it. The other thing is that everything else doesn't stay the same. So it's not like if you say, all right, what did we forecast? Let's hold everything else constant and say, well, then what would have happened? Everything else doesn't stay constant. So um, I, in general, I'll say this. I think the, the economic impacts um, of the minimum wage changes that were projected back in 1999 and in subsequent uh, rounds of this, uh, were um, the impacts were smaller than we would have guessed. Uh, that said, quite often there were several minimum wage levels that were projected, and the most aggressive was never the, the path that was taken. So. Um, and, and that's true of the last round, where the $15, I think, in 2022 was the last set of analyses we did on this before <coughs> the current one. And that's been you know, pushed back a couple more years to, to soften the impact. Um, it is, though, uh, more aggressive than anything that's been uh, done in the past. But in general, I'd say that uh, negative impacts were not uh, as pronounced as uh, as some of the models were saying they, they would have been. And I think this is true in general in the literature, is that the minimum wage changes that have been passed through many, many states have, have not been so large as to uh, uh, generate a lot of blowback, uh, negative blowback. And by the, the most common negative impacts are you know, companies that are closing or reducing hours uh, and uh, uh, creating economic loss uh, that's substantial. Now, there's still offsetting benefits that, that you could look at and say, even with job loss and all the rest, uh, this could still make sense to do. But uh, the changes have been so modest, uh, and this is across a lot of jurisdictions. I think this is why the literature typically shows there's not a whole lot of impact. As wages are getting pushed up through free market forces right now, the if prevailing wages are exceeding minimum wage changes, then there's not really a whole lot of impact that you'd expect. I don't think there's any economist, though, left, right, center, otherwise, that would say, at some level, if you you know pick a number, $50 minimum wage or a $35 minimum wage, something like that, that you wouldn't get 
a lot more substitution away from labor and a lot more negative impacts. So as a preface, that's how that's how it is. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Representative Zock. Yeah. I just wanted a clarification on the term impact. You you're talking about the impact on the economy overall. You're talking about quantitative. That's right. Not qualitative. That's right. right. And this this is a really important point because at, at some level, this is both a societal standard and a, and a labor standard. I mean, if we, if we looked at uh, child labor laws uh, and I ran an economic impact analysis and said, oh, you're going to reduce the labor force by X number of people by eliminating child labor, uh, you could end up with job losses and negative economic effects. And you still say, you know what, this makes sense. Or, even the beneficial effects that you could postulate, like children staying in school and later on being much more productive in life and all this sort of thing, are difficult to quantify. It's like measuring you know, health benefits from warmer homes and things like that that, that are harder to quantify. But the, I think this aspect of it, it's an important aspect, this isn't just an economic issue or an economic question. So the metrics that some model come up with is is part of the background to consider, but it's also an issue that's a, a labor standard and a societal standard because when people can't earn enough to cover what society is defined as being sort of essentials, uh, and uh, if they can't earn that through 35 or 40 hours of work a week, uh, then there are public benefits that they're getting. And if you shift that towards a wage base, uh, uh, standard, then you get savings in terms of uh, reduced public costs for uh, uh, transfer payments and, and support payments, both at the state and the federal level. So th it's not just an economic question, right? It, we received in, in the, in the um, memorandum, uh, in the JFO memorandum, and also testimony that we took earlier, information that Joyce provided earlier, there are a couple of things that stood out. Um, one was the uh, difference in jobs over time. And, um, and then there was this, the, this kind of odd to me piece of, oh, between 2025 and 2040, that this much change could be expected. And I'm thinking, isn't that a long time to, to, I mean, again, how do I treat something like that that says, yeah. you know, that says, well, the GDP is going to go down only 0.28% over 15 years as an average, or not even as an average, an average but, annual, a, yeah. but it's, but it's, the, I think what I want to, the key part of my question that I want to ask is that, and if I understood this correctly, was that if 10,000, if, if 10,000 jobs were created, were to be expected to be created with today's numbers being extrapolated out. And if there was going to be a displacement, or I think you call it disemployment, of 800 jobs, that would simply mean that we would have to just ratchet down our expectations and say that 9,200 jobs would be created over in that time frame, or, or that it would change the baseline so that yeah, exactly. now we need 10,000 jobs, but after this we only need, or we're only gonna have 9,200, is that? That's correct, yeah. So th this, is, this is always a tricky thing with a, a, a big structural change in a model, is how do you express the impacts? So typically the impacts are expressed in terms of a baseline that's going on, here's the economy if you don't do anything, and then you make a policy change and you say, what's the difference? And so that's how that's reported. So uh, typically it's reported as an average annual number, but sometimes uh, there, there are effects that don't occur right away. So it can take years for uh, uh, there to be full substitution of capital for labor if you raise the price of labor. Or uh, it can take a long time often for the full effects to be realized. So it's not gonna be year one, year two, year three. And then this phases in with a series of steps up. So each of those gets lagged and phased through. So it's not really to, in, in running the model, and again, it's, this is a theoretical baseline. Uh, it's not till you get out to like 2025 and kind of let the long-term effects go for about 10 years that you sort of see order of magnitude, here's what the full effects are. 
If you just took the first year, second year, third year, they'd be quite small because many of the effects have, are, are, are lagged effects. You have population responses to that. Uh, you have all those things that end up accumulating. So that's why we chose a long-term period after the last minimum wage change and took an average annual number there. But it's just to give a sense of order of magnitude. You know, that's a, a small percentage of the total labor force. Uh, it's, uh, you know, of all the minimum wage jobs that are affected, uh, less than 3% of that. Uh, so it's, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's to give you an order of magnitude. And jobs again, not people. Yeah, so that's full-time, part-time. And actually, it could also be a blending of hours. I mean, it, in theory, you could have no jobs lost, but all the hours go down, or something like that. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it is jobs, but uh, that's the way the model expresses it. But that substitution can occur in a lot of different ways. Represent the viral. Yeah. Okay, so with what you just said there, uh, right there with the extrapolation from 2025 on, given the timeline of the current proposal. Now, if the timeline was to be adjusted again after that, because it seems like we're just wrapping up like a four or five year incremental growth in minimum wage, now we're talking about another four or five year growth of incremental wage. Now, who's to say that they're not going to introduce another proposal? Well, we that's time joining. So then we're just pushing that timeline out where there's no real. If, if there's another policy change Correct. that goes beyond what's been proposed, it's going to push that we should out. model it again. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but that's so what you're saying is that's just sort of given the existing proposal. That's right. That ends at 2024, 2025. And then goes up by inflation. Inflation after. index mm -hmm. thereafter. Yes. That's okay. Right. So, but if, say, theoretically, if there was a proposal to, you know, the fight for 15 is over, now it's time for 20. Yeah. It would actually exactly. No, and 15 yeah. by then will look a lot different. So Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there might be. In which case, should do another analysis. I yeah. mean, that's a new policy change, new environment. There'll be new data. I mean, that's the other thing. is you get data, you can help understand what's happening. And if there are things that are happening that are unintended or, or really negative, then you can respond to that and either you know have a different policy to achieve the same thing. I mean, one of the things we found in the very first study, no other study had, had identified this that had been done on minimum wages, was the impact on the, on the, the uh, social assistance programs. And that you could have a family that could actually be worse off by getting a minimum wage increase because they lose benefits faster than their income goes up. And when we saw that, we said, that doesn't make sense. The purpose of this is to assist people in, in low income people. And so there's no way to talk about that issue without also talking about how to structure benefits in a way to preserve incentives to work. Mm -hmm. And then and the net result is that people are better off at the end. And, you're saying, and if I understood correctly, you were saying before there's been no, no real extensive look back. On that? Well, on, on that, we've updated it With every time. Yeah. yeah. So that that's uh, that's that's what informs the current proposal and recent proposals. But there are many states that do a minimum wage change blind to social assistance mm -hmm. programs. And I, I think we're way ahead of the game here in thinking about it with that component as a part of it. Uh, What's the turnaround time on I, I'm, I'm actually calculating that? How long would it take for your organization or JFO to? Well, they did the big benefit studies, the benefit cliff studies. Big, that's what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. That, oh, benefit that was study. the benefit cliff study itself. Okay. Yeah. And that, so Deb Brighton, who we heard from at the beginning of our conversation, yes. is coming back next week. Now that we can contextualize the information we've heard over the last two weeks, she's coming back so we can ask her the same questions mm -hmm. that uh, yeah, Deb did. Yeah. Deb did the 1999 study that I was involved with and okay. others. So, she has a really good perspective, and it was her initiative that uh, that developed that. And and the amount of work that went into that was phenomenal. I mean, the um, you know just pouring through all the regulations and all the cutoffs and how many people should be participating versus how many people actually participate. Uh, you know, she just went to a very detailed level of of depth on that and. Uh, uh, I, I think you'll appreciate hearing from her on that because she really is expert on that part of it. Yeah. 
She said something that was different. Um, the one thing that stood out in her testimony was this notion, and it goes to seeing the benefit cliffs. Um, it goes to the, that chart that yeah. shows the cliff. That struck me was um, she changed up the definition of what the minimum wage salary is in the sense that she, she went back to 35 hours okay. rather than 40, which you know, I can say, well, 15 bucks an hour is 31, 31 eight. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you may, if you're lucky yeah. enough to make yeah. 40 hours a week, whether that's one job or two jobs or three jobs, 40 hours of work gets you to that. But she, she dropped it down, I think, based on some of her research that showed, well, most people, they can work 60 hours, or they can, but the average is 35 hours at this, at this, at this rate. Is mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I'm not aware of that. So that didn't, that didn't interact with what we were doing at all in this last round. But I would, I would raise that with her. Um, again, there are a lot of assumptions like that you need to make at, at different levels. I remember the first summer study committee trying to figure out like, you know, which food plan should be used as a minimal amount of food that people get, you know, and there's these USDA plans and and the, the bottom plan was, was called the thrifty plan, right? So I think it was um, $50 a week uh, for a single person at the time. And, uh, you know, there was debate at the, among the committee is like, well, you know, which one should we use? Should we use a moderate plan or the thrifty plan or what plan? And and somebody realized that the per diem for the legislature at the time was higher than the weekly thrifty plan or the low one that was being considered. And they, you know, chose one that was a step up from that as the minimal caloric input that was needed. And so those are judgment calls. And, and that's same like with like the number that's of hours. Like shopping for food and cooking it yourself. Or yeah, that's shopping and cooking and it for yourself. Not eating out. Yeah, yeah, and the per diem here obviously is assuming Should some eating out. out, but still, that it was sort of stark contrast: one day per diem versus a week of you know buying groceries, and it is pretty bare bones. But you know what things you include, and those change over time. There were landline telephones when that first started, and now, by and large, cell phones supplanted that. And those are kind of requirements for working, for the most part, being able to be in touch with an employer and that kind of thing. So those are judgment calls. And, and you can ask also, run it both ways, if you want to see what would the impact be if we assume 40 hours, or 35, or 30, or whatever. Well, it makes a difference on looking at how that yeah. chart dips. Absolutely. Um, what, you know, the difference between gross and net. Yeah. And, and whatnot. And then family configuration is the other big thing. So are you a single parent with two kids or three kids? Or are you married with five kids or no kids? You know, all those things. Uh, single people that are, are rooming with others, that kind of stuff. So all of that <clears throat> changes it. And you're trying to pick one kind of, you know, number that you sort of saying, all right, that's a livable income. It's a really hard thing to do. The changes in healthcare also, you know, the federal uh, changes in healthcare also changed a lot of the calculations that they do on that. Okay. Um, so uh, the rest of the two memos in those uh, recent minimum wage memo things talk about the approach that we use. There are a zillion charts and things like that. And this this was that analysis that was done uh, October 2017 that had $15 an hour in 2022 and, and then these other you know approaches. But the things in this, if you scroll a little bit uh, farther down, that are still germane is sort of what industries are affected or what, what industries are most affected. Um, you know, some of the breakouts on, on things. I have some updated charts I'll show you on this. Uh, but keep going. Yeah, keep going. It's down. There's some bar charts that just show thing, keep going, yeah, keep going. That's income inequality stuff, keep going. Okay, and now keep going. There's, anyway, d depending on your level of interest in the issue, you can pour through some of this stuff. Um, these are expenditures for wealthy and poor people, keep going, um, impacts and how they run. This table we've updated. Uh, 
it, all right, these here by industry. So it's showing things like the percent of to total employment that's affected, you know, but what, what sectors of the economy are most affected, what industries um, by different wage changes. And then the next chart, I think, shows like the total wage bill. Are these, oh, jobs, are these the Vermont jobs? Or these yeah, these are Vermont jobs. jobs. Yeah, so keep going because this is 1325 and then 1250. There were all these things, but this one, for example, is the actual change in, in um, uh, millions of dollars in 2015 dollars, um, you know, by industry. So food services and drinking places, for example, has the total biggest change in, you know, like the, the wage wage bill change in food and beverage stores, educational services, social assistance, accommodation, all this. Um, and all that goes into the model when we look at what are the economic impacts, because some of these sectors are, that are export oriented can be much more vulnerable to negative impacts than uh, industrial sectors that uh, are basically serving a, a local population. So they're not competing with firms that are out of state for the most part. Um, now, some of them, like accommodation, you could say, well, the hotel industry is an export industry. If we raise our prices here, we're going to lose people to other states. Um, but I think you'd find probably the elasticity of the band there is fairly inelastic. And, and I'm not sure that would occur in, in that. So, it's, so even ones that you could think of as being export oriented um, may not be too price sensitive. But, but there are others that are, and, and in particular, we wanted to look at some of the manufacturing sectors that we might be losing jobs to. And one of the things um, you know, that's, a, that's of concern is the proximity uh, of Vermont to New Hampshire, where we have a long border. Uh, there are 29 bridge crossings over the Connecticut. Uh, it's not that hard to get back and forth. There's a pretty good flow. Uh, and uh, to what extent might there be some industries that would be vulnerable to cross-border movements? Um, and for that, let's go to the third set of, of handouts. Um, Actually, well, okay. go ahead. No, no, no. You have a question? Ahead. No, I, it just stood out that it's going to be the next. Yeah, whole difference. No, that's, that's fine. Got it I'll there. go ahead. I, I was just very striking with the little box that said that the 10 most affected industries represent 63% of the oh, change. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. The wage bill change. And right. And are. you'll hear from all these. I mean, we have, if you haven't yes. already, you know, I mean, that's, and, and then there are individual company differences. So it could be, uh, you know, so even within an industry, you can have one company that's operating on really thin margins for whatever reason, whatever variation, and others that are able to pass prices on with no problem. Uh, you know, so there's a there's a, a rich diversity of, uh, <laughs> of impacts even within an industry. So the 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 next one I want to reference is in a whole different is in a third. No, keep going. And no, it's, I think it's a, no it would be the the bottom selected charts. Yeah, the bottom one. Right. Okay, so this this is the current analysis. So that's that same table. It's in the other memo. And Joyce has incorporated a lot of this into her fiscal note, which uh, is, the, is the best oops, excuse me, uh, best synopsis of, of what's happening. Uh, but those are just some of the basic metrics on it. But let's go to the next. Um, so this gives you a, a, just a visual on the nominal uh, change. So this goes all the way back to 1939. And uh, so the effective current law uh, is that green line, which is the max of either the Vermont minimum wage or the, the U.S. minimum wage. Um, and then uh, that blue part at the end is the proposed change. Those are nominal rates. And the red line is showing the, the U.S., which is also the New Hampshire uh, minimum wage, if it doesn't change. So let's go to the next chart. This is the same thing with and an inflation adjusted basis for just the higher of the Vermont minimum wage uh, or the US, so the effective Vermont minimum wage over time. The highest it had ever been uh, was back in 1968, where it hit uh, an, in a $2,017 basis, $1,147. And, and so we'll be, at the end of this, we'll be up above that current laws right in about there. 
I have to go to the one, next one over. This adds in then the, the Vermont, I mean the New Hampshire and US rate for that green line, which over time, if it doesn't change, the nominal rate is flat, and then inflation brings down the real uh, rate there. So that would drop not to the lowest level, but it would be $6.29 in constant dollars, um, and the constant dollar projected rate is $12.80 in 2017 dollars. The dollars that are used in some of the other presentations are different bases, 2019, I think 2015 in some cases, but um, 2017 was the year that we had the employment data and the wage data, so we just based it on that. But it doesn't change the shape or the distance between the things, and we just shift everything up or down. So that just gives you a little bit of a visual in terms of long-term history of where it's been, um, you know, what's projected. Um, taking away this, so the the highest historical level it ever was was 1147 back in the late 60s. Yeah. Now let's take away the the current legislative trajectory of the minimum wage increase, just the 2.4 percent unemployment already pushing up wages naturally. Do you have any idea of where we would meet that line, just given the current market conditions for labor at that level? Well, that current that blue line that goes straight across is what would be expected to occur. This is a real basis, so it's an after inflation adjustment. Yeah. This, it would stay basically flat at, at, in real terms. So even if inflation is higher, mm -hmm. the, the rate's going to go up by inflation. Basically. So, that, so the natural upward pressure of just sort of like low unemployment with people having to pay more for labor at this rate, you think it's just going to flat out? Well, that, it, by like, definition it yeah. does, because it's adjusted for inflation. So a, yeah. every year, if inflation goes up 3%, then Correct. that goes up 3%. If it goes up, so on a nominal basis, it might actually be higher. But yeah, I think on I'm a sure. real basis, it's going to be exactly the same. Because by definition, it is. That's, you know, it, it okay. adjusts to inflation. No, because I, I just, I, I know I'm talking to a lot of employers right now who are saying that they're raising their wages naturally in, in this price point, in this wage point. Oh, yeah. Just to acquire labor. Yeah, absolutely. So the that, prevailing wage yeah. is accelerating. Yes. And so yeah, that's why I say it could look very different. Pardon? Do you have any idea of what the prevailing wage is accelerating at right now? Uh, about 3% right now. Okay. Uh, so, so with inflation, I mean, there have been like two ticks over 3%. Yeah. For quite a while, it had been pretty stagnant. I mean, for a very long time, it had been quite stagnant. So everybody's talking about labor markets being tight, but mm -hmm. it wasn't translating into wages. If markets are really tight, that's where it shows up. Otherwise, you've got slack in the labor force, you know, unused capacity of people will yeah. come in. But there's been very little wage growth. In the last, you know, several readings on it, not only has inflation been low, but the, the wage growth has been up around 3%. Mm -hmm. So that's real growth in, in wages. Okay. Um, you know, all right, so the baseline has a forecast of that, and it does include a cycle. You know, with continued tightening, but then a slowing, you know, after that. So between now and 2024, there's likely to be something of a slowing, whether it's a recession or just, you know, a pause or, you know, whatever. But um, before that, you'll get a increase in wages, a, a more a, a faster acceleration of wages. During that, they'll they'll flatten off. Uh, okay. So uh, hard to say, but I think probably. $15 isn't going to, you know, if anything, it's going to be more muted. That, that suggests that sure. the impacts are going to be more muted. Beneficial and negative will be more muted because, you know, Amazon now is a $15 in wage. Bank of America the other day said $20. Uh, I don't know if you heard mm -hmm. that. They're not doing this because, you know, the goodness of their hearts. No. They're doing it because that's what they need to do to get halfway decent workers. And, you know, you need somebody who shows up on time that's, you know, not too drug affected, who, you know, you're, you're going to have to pay uh, something more like that. When we look at some of the New Hampshire data, and I want to share some of the preliminary work that's been done on this, um, this, is, this is very much a work in progress, um, but it takes off from that recommendation that we get data and study it relative to New Hampshire, because that's a, a vulnerability that we have. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to look at how the wage distribution differs in New Hampshire to Vermont. But what we see, and I'll, I'll show you with some of the charts, 
is you get a pocket of people that are sub Vermont minimum wage that are you know it's about 13 percent of all workers in New Hampshire are learning earning less than the Vermont minimum wage but then very quickly in almost every sector it goes above the, the Vermont the Vermont wage <laughs> that's unaffected by the minimum wage mm -hmm. so in general wages are higher in New Hampshire and part of that uh, has to do with proximity to Boston but it it tells you the prevailing wages you know are are up quite a bit higher yeah. it also suggests that there's uh, an effect called wage compression that we know about and, and expect but but some employers will give you know meet the minimum wage uh, uh, standard mm -hmm. with wage increase there but they'll lower wage increases throughout the rest of the workforce so that those are not quite as highly paid in order to keep total labor costs about the same. Mm -hmm. And you know, if that's a really pronounced uh, feature in it, that changes the distribution. But a lot of the other effects don't show up because you're, you're not getting a whole lot of net new income. Uh, you're getting a, ch a, a change in the distribution. You're just getting shuffled around. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, I'll show you that with some of the charts. Just, no, just totally. to get to that, or is there another question first? No. Yes, sir. The three percent increase you spoke of over what period of time? That's like the last month, year over year basis. The last two months, so when the labor <coughs> report year. came out, yeah, uh, they looked at average hourly earnings and, and other compensation cost measures, and it, it was I think three point one, three point two percent. So that's nominal. So you adjust that for inflation, but that's still pretty good. Um, so As compared to as compared to what we got before, which was flat or even declining in some periods. So that's just indicating that there is, you know, there are labor pressures. You also hear about these companies that are, you know, voluntarily increasing wages, and, and that's a reflection of what they're having to pay to get uh, high level, you know, good enough people. So what, is, what does that mean, though, in, in terms of, I'm looking at this chart here, it says if, if, if New Hampshire, well, I mean, let's just say for today, there's a 49% differential between our minimum wage and their minimum wage. So yeah. what, what does what you just said mean in, in, in real terms? Okay. Well, let, let me give you a peek at, you know, this isn't a thorough analysis because you know, every time we do this issue, this comes up, and we say, oh, we really need the same data from New Hampshire. We need, you know, all this base information we have to use to be able to start to analyze it. And each time we try to chip away a little bit about it, but, you know, that's why there's a request to say, if we go to this, it would be worth doing this right and studying it. But we were able to construct um, uh, uh, estimates of the wage distribution for New Hampshire uh, using unpublished DOL data that we ran the same methodology for Vermont and it was virtually identical with the actual DOL data that we got from Vermont so we have confidence in the approach uh, and Chloe Wexler at Joint Fiscal did a lot of the work on this and so we generated data for New Hampshire to try to get a sense of this so let's go to the next and I'll just give you a, a a brief picture of it. This this is um, uh, this is a table again with all the industries, and we're trying to look for vulnerable industries and what sorts of things might be happening. What it has in the first column is total New Hampshire employment for each of those industries. Uh, the next column is the share of total employment that that industry represents. So it's saying, how important is that industry for the state of, of New Hampshire? So general merchandise stores are 2.4% of that. They're 15,610 workers, and that's 2.4% of all New Hampshire employment. So you'll see a sector that's either overrepresented or underrepresented relative to something else. Um, the next column is the number of New Hampshire workers that are earning less than $15 an hour in 2017 uh, uh, is the time period. And it, so again, that's not $15 further. And we can do this for different 
wage price. If I were doing this analysis relative to this proposal, I'd use $12.80 and, and run the analysis that way. Uh, so that means there are 42%, 41.9% of the workers in that sector are earning less than $15 an hour. So then we start to go to Vermont and say, all right, total employment, these are sort of mirror things, just if, if you look at it. So there's 3,510 workers in Vermont, and it's a much smaller share of, of the total Vermont labor force, about half, it's 1.2%. But 74% of the workers in Vermont are earning less than $15 an hour versus only 42% in New Hampshire. So, so um, when, when, I'm, when I'm looking at this, this other metric they have out there, if you take total employment in New Hampshire, it's about 2.13 times what it is in Vermont. So it's about double, population's about double, the number of workers are about double. And so if, if there's a number that's above 2.13 over here, it would be a sector that New Hampshire is overrepresented in relative to Vermont, a sector that it's doing really well in. And most of the retail sectors uh, uh, in New Hampshire are overrepresented. They're sort of shaded more yellow-red. Uh, and the sectors in which Vermont is overrepresented are less than 2.13, so the number would be less than that, and they're shaded with green. So there are sectors that, you know, might surprise you, and others that don't. So uh, that retail's a little bit overrepresented is not a big surprise. We know where the retail establishments are. Also, uh, New Hampshire benefits from a lot of uh, retail demand from Massachusetts. Uh, that, that also uh, affects that. But if we looked at, we did a study maybe four or five years ago on, on just uh, sales and use revenues and the, and, and, and the competitive pressures from New Hampshire. And, and we note that virtually all the big box stores up the Connecticut River on the, on the New Hampshire side of the river. Um, and that's been attributed to the sales tax and if you, that differential, and you look back over time, and it pretty much starts about when the sales tax starts. Um, but it also starts at, so just not to jump ahead, but uh, so we went all the way up around in Maine, also as a sales tax. It's about the same as Vermont. It's a little bit lower, but it's about, about the same. Well, there you don't have all the big box stores on the New Hampshire side. They're almost equally on the Maine side and the New Hampshire side, even though they're close and could easily have been place on the other side. So the thing that turns out also occurred at the same time the sales tax was introduced was Act 250, which really discouraged development uh, of those types of stores, made it difficult and more expensive to, to do that. Um, and, and that, I think, is a, is, the, is a bigger factor than either a wage differential that, that exists or uh, a sales tax. Uh, on that, um, so you know there, there are there are a lot of things. Look at, for example, now at gas stations. So when gas stations are much more highly represented, way overrepresented in Vermont, it's 1.3 percent of total Vermont employment is gas stations, and it's only 0.7 percent in New Hampshire. Well, the interstate runs up on the on the uh, Vermont side of the of the river, and. Um, and also, just the way pricing has developed, if you look at the way gasoline is priced in New Hampshire, right near the Vermont border, they run it up close to the Vermont price. The deeper you go into New Hampshire, the cheaper it gets. But the, the, the profit maximizing approach is not to try to get people clear across the river, but just let's just stay a little bit underneath that. Um, I, and, and that shows up here. As that's not, we're not losing gas stations to New Hampshire, even though there's a differential in the gas tax, even though the other items like cigarettes and things like that that people buy at gas stations, a lot of these things like that um, uh, are, are, are affected. So anyway, each of these analyses has, has some part of it, but let's, let's go through to some of the charts. So um, let's go up to one of the manufacturing ones. Um, that one's not. Yeah, let's do textile motors or wood products. That's the next one. 
Yeah. Paper. Put it on the next one. Yeah. Furniture. Yeah. So this this is a sector that, if we were to look at that chart, so furniture manufacturing, um, is is one that you would that has a, a high share of, of relatively high share of low wage workers uh, uh, the, for a manufacturing sector. In general, manufacturing is not that, that high. But uh, there are only a thousand furniture uh, manufacturing jobs in New Hampshire, and there are 1,340 in Vermont. And you say, well, if the wage differential is what's, you know, might be driving potential loss there because it's it's you know uh, it's a low wage industry and and if we keep raising our minimum wage we're going to lose even more there. Look at the distribution of the jobs. So this is a percentile of employees. This is an hourly wage. So here at the minimum, you know. You know, Vermont ends at 10. That was the minimum wage in 2017. And there's some workers in that first uh, 10 percentile of, of employees that are below that. But then all the way up the rest of the way, they're higher paid. It, it sort of suggests that there's, there's much bigger things that are affecting some of the sectors like manufacturing. That if you're competitive in manufacturing, you're not you're not competitive globally because you're paying, you have access to cheap labor in this country. So there's you, either you've mechanized what you're doing, you've found some niche in this sector, um, but this doesn't suggest that just because of a minimum wage increase in this sector we'd be losing a lot of a lot of jobs. There'd be a strong pull across the border. So we can go through a whole bunch of these. We have we run these for every sector, but this is not an uncommon shape for the two curves to have, you know, a, a differential down low, but then as you go up, uh, it's the spread is the wages are higher in New Hampshire. So is there correlating information that shows that the higher wages reflect or where jobs? I mean, yes, they have less of those higher paying jobs than we have in this case. We have 1,300, they have? We have 1,300 total jobs. What right. I'm saying is that as a share of our total employment, we have a higher mix of furniture manufacturing. We're, we're, we're you know, it's more important to the Vermont economy than it is to New Hampshire. And yet you'd think if low wages was the thing that was making or breaking that sector, they'd be doing better because they don't have to pay people more. But what this says is that, you can't make manual. You can't make furniture using minimum wage labor. You can pay the bottom 10 percent of your employees less, but your total wage bill in New Hampshire or Vermont or almost anywhere in the United States is going to be higher. And, and and that's fine as far as it goes. But that does. I mean, it, does it take into account? These jobs are in Manchester or closer to Massachusetts where it's more expensive well, to live. That, and that's the thing. next level of analysis yeah, yeah. you really want to do. We really want to look at if, if we could do something county, county, you know, right on the border, that would be useful. But these are the sectors that we were most concerned about. And and again, this is just like a little toe in the water sure. of analysis here. But I just I share it because there are some interesting things that will come out even from just looking at you know, a first cut of it, and also um, the the need to do more if we do go with a a more aggressive minimum wage uh, in the state to keep our eye on things like this. Now, if we go through some other, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. doesn't this show that the market's adjusting it? It doesn't need the state to adjust the minimum wage. It don't, New Hampshire is a significant. I, I want to make sure I understand. Yeah, you're going really. Very quickly for me. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, it's I mean, just, I know it's a no, no, I just want to stop for a second. So yeah. I, I grasp what you're saying. Yeah. So if if New Hampshire has a significantly lower minimum wage, and is and wouldn't this perhaps show that actually wages are better in New Hampshire than this because of the market? In the sector, wages are better. Yes. If you're in the bottom ten percent, they're worse. You know, if you're the guy sweeping up the shop at the end of the furniture manufacturing day, you'd be better off working in Vermont than in New Hampshire. I see. Um, and they save a little bit of money on that person or those people. But then everybody else in the shop 
is getting more than they get in Vermont. Okay. So would a Vermont company move to New Hampshire to save on this? Doesn't look like it. So that's that's more the the direction that it's that it, it's you know leading. But again, it, it's preliminary and it's and it's worth looking into both where they're located and exactly which companies they are. Because sometimes one or two companies can really bias something. Yeah. Well, and and, and I, I get to the point, at least in this particular case too, where if we have more, by, by statistical margins, they should have twice as many, they should have closer to 2,800 or 2,600 um, yeah. Woodworkers, yeah. just by just by that yes. percentage, right. Mm -hmm. right. but they don't, and which means maybe nothing, but except for how important the industry is to their. Well, state. when yeah. when we do statistical analysis on it, we take a lot of industries after we clean that data, and then we run regression analyses looking at like all the industries and say, you know, what jumps out, you know, is there a correlation between the the you know low wages and the share of the importance of that industry to the state. So if we look at accommodation, for example, uh, you know, so hotels, motels, Vermont is much more highly dependent upon tourism and hotels and motels than New Hampshire. And uh, yet if we look at the wage spread there, again, this is not something that, you know, you, you would expect they say, oh, I have my hotel in Vermont, but the wages are lower in New Hampshire, so I'll move to New Hampshire and have the motel there. It, that's unlikely to happen. And so there we get a wage spread. If you maybe scroll through, uh, it's going to be one where the two lines stay above. So I organize these by the shape of the lines. Um, keep going, keep going. It's pretty far down. Construction is another interesting one. Gasoline stations, where we talked about those. Uh, food and beverage. Yeah, keep going. It's like food and beverage. Uh, social assistance. Okay, accommodation. There. So there, the Vermont line is higher all the way through. So wages in hotels and motels in Vermont are higher than New Hampshire. Now at the bottom, they're quite a bit lower, but all the way up the spectrum. And that's kind of unusual. There are not too many industries that are like that. So you would say there, yeah, their wage bill, you know, you could shift your wage bill down if you were sort of an average hotel motel. But th that's not a sector that moves easily. It's not, you know, so, so am I concerned about job loss there? No, but I would be in, you know, the, the, the furniture manufacturing thing. I would have, had that looked like this, I would have said, that could be a no-brainer, you know, that would be an easy thing to, to go with. So anyway, it's, it's I'm, I'm just showing this to illustrate the importance of trying to dig down with real hard data and figure out what's happening and what could be affecting minimum wage and where the risks exist. So um, unfinished, but you have just a snapshot. Uh, the, the one thing people have started asking me about are the mom and pop stores or the family owned small stores in rural towns. Do you have a graph of that kind of sector? So that would probably be, um, Miscellaneous store retailers or food and beverage stores. And the problem is that's going to include a lot of big stuff too. Mm. Uh, maybe the miscellaneous store retailers would not, might be smaller, but a lot of them are food, beverage, and sometimes gas too. So it depends how they classify that. I think I'd have to dig into that more. I think the problem there more is if you have thin profit. Yes. So, you, you know, you you would want to pass on costs. So to the I don't I don't think your clientele will disappear. But how price sensitive is the clientele to that? And there you could get a reduction in hours if they just say we're going to provide lower quality service because we can't, you know, have two people in the store at the same time because uh, of the wage bill. Um, so there are a lot of different responses you might get, but you could get some labor loss from that. And is there, do you, in any of your analysis, is there kind of an urban-rural separation of this to look at this? Because I'd love to be able to do that, but we haven't. We I'm in South Florida, and everyone says, well, Chittenden County is different. 
And so, so I don't know with all of this how to calibrate this for the rest of the state. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a good point. And um, you know, there are a lot of subgroups of companies, industries, and geographies yeah. that would be great to look at. I'd love to do it, but okay. um, so far that hasn't happened. Thank you, Representative Brown. Are any of these uh, indicators take into consideration New Hampshire workers? coming to Vermont to work for the higher rate wage? Well, that's, Does that reflect anywhere here? Um, yeah, I mean, that can happen sure. uh, as, as well. So uh, some data include, are, are based on place of work, and some are based on place of residence. OK. So you can look at both of those things. It kind of but, sorts itself out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you've got, uh, again, you would then expect to see a labor shortage say in a bigger labor shortage in retail in New Hampshire than Vermont if you had a higher minimum wage and that's a sector where there are a lot of workers yep. doing that. Uh, or an ability for restaurants to get to find people in Vermont and they can't in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I haven't heard anecdotally of that sort of thing. I think what ends up happening is they pay what they need to to get people and price accordingly. So to get back to the original question, not to ask you whether or not our minimum wage is too high or too low, there's a policy question that would make um, well, we can make determinations based on living livable wage, which is where which came out in nineteen ninety nine, right? That was I think when the, the, the basic yeah. bit of basic needs budget must have come out of a study. Yeah. Um, but how how can we best look at this? And, and Matt, I'm going to not put you on the spot, but you had a larger, you had a larger idea of like the larger financial world. Um, you know, last, some of your concerns were about the. the well, just sort of like that, where, where we are with like global economy wise right now, going into a recession, and what that looks, or theoretically going into a recession. A lot of people are anticipating that. There's been some signals with it, um, given. You know, my, my concerns with that are a few things with like the global recession. Uh, the yield curve inversion recently, I know, raised a lot of bells. Um, we're not looking at subprime lending with mortgages anymore. We're looking at subprime lending with like car loans and credit cards. And I, I kind of see that as a rinse repeat, just in a different box than what we did in 08 or what, what, what happened in 08. And taking a look at if we are heading into a, a a retraction, you know, what this 10 to 20 percent retraction on a, on a business's revenue look like if we're putting policy in a place that obligates a seven percent ish wage increase year over year. You know, what does that look like when we're already experiencing low unemployment pushing up wages? How does that accelerate things? How does that decelerate things? I know that's kind of a big question, but. Yeah, but I mean, that is something else we look at because in doing the revenue forecasts, we're running different scenarios of the broader economy. Mm -hmm. And so all those are things that we're looking at. Um, what we have as a baseline forecast right now is a slowing of growth uh, in fiscal 21, mm -hmm. but not a recession. Okay. But, uh, you know, there has been more chatter about it recently. The, 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 inversion uh, is one signal, but it also is a false signal sometimes. So mm -hmm. yeah, there needs to be something that's, uh, uh, that's an imbalance that corrects and you point to, I mean, I think corporate debt is probably more vulnerable even than some of the other financial areas, but, but there, there are plenty of candidates for that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad on conclusion. Mm -hmm. I think it's always good, though, to be reevaluating what you're doing if there's a multi-year thing based on how it's doing. And, you know, I, I mean, you have that power, even if you pass something that says this is going to go, you know, for five years or whatever, uh, is you can revisit it. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like actual information to try to understand, well, 
what's the impact that it's having? Yeah. And and let's evaluate that and then let's do what's best. I mean, a, a lot of my concerns in that is is we're Vermont seeing a lot of growth since the recession, and, and I'm in the restaurant hospitality business. Yeah. And I weathered the storm, and that was a really dark place. Yeah. For a lot of years. Um, so we're seeing an expansion statewide. <coughs> Hasn't only been in, in retail hospitality, but it's also been in sort of like the, the, the higher end disposable income level of like uh, alcohol boutique manufacturing, whether it be beer, dark house socks, things of that nature. So when people start to see it, you know, uh, increasing their, their quarterly statements on their 401ks or whatever else. Mm -hmm. so that's when I notice actually spending slows in, in 20 years of the retail, or excuse me, the food sector. Um, the people are not necessarily always making less money, but they freak out when they see their 401k statement, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they're not cashing it in for years, it's just kind of like this funny behavioral well, fact. Yeah, it's just funny behavioral fact. So trying to like anticipate, because we're in, We've seen the largest, you know, uh, economic expansion since what, like World War II. Not the like that. largest, but the longest. Or the longest, excuse me, the longest. Yeah, and which is part of why it's been the longest is it hasn't been the largest. It hasn't been the largest. That's why it's lower. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So misspoke there. So that's sort of like my concern being a tourist dependent economy, and then even <coughs> if like we are manufacturing and exporting, there's sort of disposable income items. So as that disposable income becomes less mm -hmm. accessible to people, we're going to see slower sales, slower employment capabilities. Yeah. And that's my fear of this sort of this five year plan right now. Sure. Is are we are we putting the throttle down into a bad economic environment? Yeah. I mean you could argue you know, the other side of that would be, you know, labor market's never been tighter. Uh, it's you know wages are going to start accelerating on their own. There's going to be more growth than people anticipate, and it could be better too. Typically, those risks are handled uh, in the private sector by running alternative scenarios. So, firms that we work for in the private sector that we're doing economic forecasting for will run a scenario that's like a, a full-fledged recession. We'll run one that's like almost no, just continuation of the good times. Uh, because each one has different implications for how the uh, risks they take with respect to marketing, hiring, new production facilities, things like that. Uh, the state of Vermont almost never does that, but you know, occasionally we have, typically around really bad events like 9-11. Uh, we did a whole bunch of alternative simulations when it was clear it was a different world. Kind of. So, um, you know, so you could do things like that, it, so you sort of understood the range of risk and what the implications would be. Um, but even if you knew those, you'd probably just want the flexibility to adjust if you needed to in the future, because nobody can tell the future. It's no, not, you know, no. so it's going to be how quickly do you respond. In general, the sector you're talking about is doing pretty well, and it's demographically driven and income driven. So older people spend a much higher share of their disposable income on services rather than goods. And tourism, travel, eating out, things like that are a higher share of, of their expenditures than on stuff, durables, and the like. So that's why that sector, especially in New England, has grown more quickly than a lot of other sectors. And um, it was hit by the recession, but it, it came back stronger. A lot of other things didn't come back much stronger or came back later. So, um, so in terms of secular trends, that's apt to be in better shape five, 10 years from now. That will still be a, a strong component of the state economy. Uh, but around that, you can get a recession that will collapse everything if it was severe. Yeah, so. yeah, and, and I guess I was just, uh, wanted to ask your opinion on like, and I, I mean, I know it's economic keys, right? But what the the sentiments were about, and I know, and I do understand that when there is a recession, Vermont doesn't take it as typically it doesn't take the brunt of the financial impact. Oh, it depends. It depends what's driving it. If you go back to 1990, we're way worse than oh, national okay. recession. Yeah, and it came earlier and harder. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> So uh, yeah, there are a few things that with with that with long some real estate. What was the driver of that one? Was real that estate. Real estate. It was okay. a, it was a huge, as, at more severe than the last one for 
local stuff and for New England. Uh, but there have been these regional real estate, yeah, uh, regional real estate cycles that have been huge. It rarely happened at a national level. And this last one was one of the only ones that affected almost every state. There was one state that didn't drop. Mm. You want to guess? That didn't drop. Yeah, one state that right through the real estate crash and the recession had no decline in home prices. North Dakota. Yeah. It's North Dakota. Ah. Yeah. That's when the oil boom, the oil boom was going on. The oil boom, is, they have a state bank, and uh, uh, they also had a lot of wind investment right around that same time. Mm -hmm. And they just sailed through it. Um, anyway, uh, so you, I mean, those are risks you have to hedge against. But probably the best way, policy-wise, is to just give yourself flexibility if you have to change course. And you can do that without it being explicit. But some states have written in some review policy each year. I think New York or some of them. And, and they'll like check in and see if, yeah, is it OK to keep keep going up under okay. some schedule. Interesting. So yeah. It's an interesting bookend um, as, we, as we wrap up to think that 1990, you had, you had made some other mention about another but 1990 was about the same time that we um, started this pension situation, where yeah. we, because of that recession, we started uh, not putting money. money. Yeah. And then the and then the okay. other bookend is the 2038, 2040, when we're going to stop paying 170 million dollars of general fund money into that fund, you know, because. We will have squared it <laughs> in what in 2038, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, what? Yeah. I'll be 77. Not that I'm applying for the pension, but <laughs> yeah. but you know, it's a long time away in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, that's a think, whole other topic. It's huge. But it but it plays into all of this economic stuff because again, we can't provide. We took so much testimony from the VNAs and the home, adult daycares and the Medicaid stuff that we we're not obviously it's not easy for us to increase those numbers to take on the minimum wage for those particular industries mm -hmm. or at least overtly it's not a clear way to do it it's still pulling them funds out of appropriations because 170 million dollars plus is being put aside to pay off these pensions made decisions that were made back in the 1990s. So it's just- No, it's as, a, as a process that I think there's really important lessons with that. And it, and it is hard for government to look, you know, beyond, you know, your terms, your likely terms in office, the, you know, w what the impacts might be. And I compare that to some of the private sector things that are done where because of economic interests, there's, a, a, a longer term horizon and there you know there was no stress testing then there were no credible economic forecasts that were associated with some of that and most of all there was no adjustment when it was obvious those returns were not coming in to say you know all right we've got at least four or five years of much lower rate of return let's at least crunch those numbers um, but there's no like check-in it's kind of been a willful blindness that has occurred and it and it's a deep hole that now you're left with and um, yeah it, it, it going forward even to get to 2038 is still what I would consider pretty optimistic uh, it ought to at least be stress test you know I, I treasurer says I mean that's a whole different vocabulary for me but I think this the treasurer sure I mean the treasurer always says the same things you just said I mean if we're not getting X percent return, if, we, if the assumption is off, yeah, you know, on a year-to-year -year basis, which in, in, you know, a year-to-year -year, maybe five percent, seven percent, two percent, eight percent, yeah, you may get the return that you get over time. But um, I mean, last year may not have been a great year. This year may be. You know, I mean, it's, it's yeah, but you, but you can bracket it, and you certainly should have more than one scenario. And if it starts looking like, oh yeah, that's the scenario that's that's actually occurring then you want to make an adjustment and, and even then have some slack that's on the conservative side. With all the other budgeting, you know, it's, it's relatively conservative. We yeah. come up with a balanced budget all the time. And, and it's, uh, this could be done the same way. But so many states, because of the time horizon, fail to do that. And sometimes the interest of the parties that were advising the states 
And that's another part of this that I think is problematic, is you're not getting independent, always getting independent uh, review. Advice. Right, we're getting a lesson on what it means to bind the future legislature um, by your decisions you made back, way back when. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, uh, Mary. I have one more. I have a yeah. question uh, regarding New Hampshire and Vermont. Who makes the lowest wages in New Hampshire? Do you know? Um, what group? Largely women. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, much the same kind of distribution. And Deb Wrighton did some uh, charts with uh, a run on some census data that show that distribution. I think in the first, in one of the memos, anyway, one of those old memos, there's, there's some charts that, that show by educational attainment, by gender, um, by, I don't know, hours work, different things, you know, who those people are. But they're, they're the least demanding people in society. So you get a job, you're not, you know, arguing for a pay increase every year, you're not threatening to leave and go somewhere else. And you're just taken advantage of, quite frankly. <laughs> so um, it does tend to be disproportionately female, like almost 60-40. And uh, that's something I'd like to look at more closely, that 13% of the New Hampshire workforce that's earning less than the Vermont minimum wage. Because essentially, that's who you're protecting here. The market will be affecting everybody else. But it's that pocket of people that you're saying, in Vermont, that's not how we do it. So they would be the people that would be left behind. If, if you didn't uh, have them in, if you just kept the federal seven and a quarter, probably our profile would look pretty similar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank if, you. There, if there are other questions that come up, I'm happy to respond to them, either emails, whatever. And Joyce is also around for Joyce. All the same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, thank, you. thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Yeah.